my name is Rodrigo Chiossi. Uh, I work with Samsung in Brazil. And I'll be here today talking to you, to you a little about Android security and uh, the modifications in the platform that we can do to improve its security in an overall. Uh, for uh, those of you who were here last year, uh, I, you may know me by the Android X Half project. Uh, just a quick feedback on how the project has been during this year. It has grown a lot. Now it has basically all major versions of Android and the kernel available online for, um, for browsing. And it gets an average of 10K page views a day, which is way much more than I expected from uh, the platform. We get much more devs than I thought. So, OK, and uh, why am I here today talking to you about Android security? Uh, I work at a Samsung lab in Brazil called CD. Uh, this lab was originally created to, perf to, to perform uh, local modifications to phones to the Latin American market. So we would get the phones from uh, Europe, uh, US, and then adapt them to the Latin American market. But then over the years, it became a uh, research, uh, research lab in all major, major areas of uh, mobile phones. So uh, in one of those, which is really strong right now, is the security research which is the team that I work with. Uh, I've been working with Android security since the end of 2010. Uh, over the first year of our group, we focused mostly on Android hardening and implementing Android features to improve uh, security, such as uh, our custom version of ASLR, uh, a custom firewall, uh, file system encryption, just to name a few. But in the past year, since the end of 2011, we've moved a bit more towards offensive security. So uh, what we do, we, we take our devices and test for security holes uh, in all layers of the platform. Uh, we do test everything. So we start with the kernel, looking for bugs introduced by our drivers or things like this, file system, Android platform, and also uh, Android applications, which is what I'm going to talk a bit uh, about for you today. Um, when, well, let's jump into some, some interesting, I know, wait. Uh, what, what apps do we actually analyze? Well, we focus on preloaded apps, which are the apps that uh, actually comes into, uh, with our phones. Uh, this is our primary target. We do test Samsung apps and apps developed by partners. Uh, when I uh, talk about Samsung apps, it's not necessarily things that are implemented by Samsung, but they ship under Samsung name. And also known preloaded apps, which are apps that, uh, those are mostly enterprise focused apps so there are things that are not shipped with the phone, but are likely to, to be loaded in the phone. Um, again, also from Samsung and for, from partners. And there is also this third group with popular critical apps. Uh, I mean critical because those are apps that actually perform some critical operation in the phone. So we won't be testing for, for things like Angry Birds or so. Uh, those are more like uh, antivirus apps, uh, mobile device management apps, and things like this that actually have uh, high uh, power over the capabilities of the phone and, um, and are likely to be loaded in our phones. Uh, okay, so now let's jump to some, some numbers here. What you see here is uh, the result of one year of app assessment from the Samsung team in Brazil. Uh, those are the 12 most uh, common uh, vulnerabilities we found in the apps during our assessment. Uh, what I did to build this thing, I got pretty much all the assessments we did over the year. Those are uh, done mainly by hand, so 
We have some automated processes to test for some vulnerabilities, but when we test an app, we got a developer dedicated to checking everything, decompiling, read the code, and uh, it's a mix of black box testing. Those happen happens mostly when the, we got 30 apps, uh, 30 party apps, uh, and also white box testing when we got some Samsung apps that we got sourced. And uh, I got all those reports and classified the vulnerabilities, trying to find some sort of pattern or some kind of uh, error that were more, uh, was more common. Uh, here, if you look at the first one, you got the open broadcast receiver, which is over 25% of all the, uh, all the errors we found, and proper SSL handling, open services, and so on. Uh, I'll be talking about a bit about the, the, these biggest groups and uh, how they actually could be avoided on platform side. Okay, so let's start with open broadcast receivers. I, I suppose you've heard of broadcast receivers before, but it's an, overall it's just a component in the app that listens for an intent and then performs some action based on that intent. Uh, what's called an open broadcast receiver, uh, just as a note, none of those uh, security vulnerabilities are new. They are all known in the community. Uh, so they've been uh, talked about before, but they still happen very often. So, but going on, uh, when you have an open broadcast receiver, it's a broadcast receiver that has been exported to platform, and it is available to everybody to access. So, any app could send an intent and trigger the action from that broadcast receiver. It's not always an error, so you can actually have a broadcast receiver that is intended to be open to everybody, but that's usually not what the developer intended. So the most, most common use case for open these uh, exported broadcast receivers would be to enable that functionality to be exported to another application from the same app or within a, a, a private context. So you want this exported, but you don't want it exported to everybody. Uh, now, let, let's take a look up, uh, at the default behavior of broadcast receivers. If you, got, if you declare a broadcast receiver in your, in your app, just a very basic one without any intent filters or anything, uh, the default, default behavior is it's going to be restricted to your app. So the only way that you can trigger that functionality would be calling uh, using the, the class name directly, and it, won't be, it wouldn't be visible to the outside. And it, it's a good thing, because uh, the most common case, or the, the simplest case, it is protected. So it was a very good design choice to, to keep it restricted. But um, when you think about exported broadcast receivers, actually the most common behavior is uh, the most common intended behavior is that this thing is, should be exported to a private context, and it's not what actually happens. Uh, when you export uh, broadcast receivers, at first it's going to be available to everybody, and only then you can restrict it to your application. Here's just a quick example on how you could protect your broadcast receiver. So uh, you can declare a custom permission and uh, say this permission is signature, which means that only apps that uh, have the same signature as this app that de declared this permission will be able to have it. And then in your receiver, you say that uh, well, when, when you add this intent future, uh, filter here, uh, Android's going to export your, your broadcast receiver. So uh, here you're going to be exporting it, and you're saying that necessarily whoever sends an intent to this, thing, to this receiver will have to have this permission. So in this case, you have it protected. It, this is not the only way to protect your receiver. You could also... Uh, 
uh, declare that uh, say that your your action or or the intent you're gonna use to to trigger this receiver is protected. So, but I I prefer this way because it's clear here that you have the intention to protect it. So it, it's can, it's like clear, and uh, you can also. Be, uh, well, as I said, when you have this intent filter, it's going to be exported. But you can also add the exported tag to say that, no, I want this exported no matter what. Which is also good because you, reading the code, you, it's clear that this thing exported. So let, let's now take a look at what's the proper implementation flow of, of a broadcast receiver. First, we declare a broadcast re receiver. Then you're going to export it to everybody in a, in a protected state. And only then you add the mechanism to protect your receiver. But what actually happens is that the developer will declare a broadcast receiver. He's going to run the, the app. It's not going to work. He will look for a solution, most likely in Stack Overflow, which is the biggest Android resources. Everybody knows that. And uh, then you're going to find the first result will be someone say, oh, OK, you have to export your receiver. The developer is going to export it. We'll try again, and it's going to work. The problem is that if you check the actual development flow that the developer is going through, the point where the program actually works is not the protected state. It ended up stopping one step earlier. So. Uh, from this point on, the, the, the developer is going to try the app, it's going to work, and he will just move on to the next feature because that's what you do when you have uh, deadline-oriented programming, or <laughs> which is pretty much everybody. So what actually could be done here to, to avoid this problem? Well, uh, what we have, the, the current flow for implementation, we have the step that you declare a broadcast receiver, then you export it and protect it, and only then you protect it. But if you have the development flow in the opposite order, so you would declare the broadcast receiver, then move to an exported protected state, and only then you unprotect it or open it to everybody. What would happen is that in the most common uh, implementation flow or use case, which is when you want to export it in a, in a restricted context, if you follow the same flow that the developer did in the last one for the looking at the internet for a solution and everything, uh, the point where his app would actually work would be still be the second stage, but the second stage would be now the protected state. So you don't change anything that the developer would do. We still have the same developer with the same experience uh, in Android programmer. Uh, programming, but now you, he ended up with a secure app. So, if in the design of the how the, the broadcast receivers are implemented, if we change the way uh, it takes for a developer to reach the unprotected state, we can actually make the platform uh, accidentally safer because you don't actually need to, to teach one more thing to the developer to get. Uh, safer applications. Well, this uh, happens with broadcast receivers, but it, this is not exclusive to broadcast receivers. It also happens with services and content providers. In uh, all three cases, the developer will reach the unprotected state before he reaches the, prote the exported protected state. Uh, those two, they have different mechanisms to uh, export their functionalities. And in the case of services, what happens is that you enable everybody to bind to your service. So uh, the solution is pretty much the same. You have to declare this service uh, should require a, a permission for the service to be uh, bound only by uh, trusted apps. And uh, the same with content providers. One interesting thing interesting thing is that last week, I think on Wednesday, there, there was a blog post from the Google security team uh, talking about improvements in Android 
4.2. And one of the things that they addressed are uh, content providers. Because content providers, the default behavior would be for them to be exported. And now they changed it so it is restricted and you have to manually set them to export it. Uh, so uh, the default would be uh, the, the, safe, uh, the safe context. Uh, this is good, because this indicates that Google are kind of aware of this thing. I don't know if this is going to solve the problem or not. Yes? What happened to the old app? Well, the, it's more of a matter of, of how did you compile it. If you compile with uh, an older uh, SDK, it's, not, uh, it's going to be exported. If you compile with a new one, you have to manually declare it. It's not, uh, well, the, the runtime behavior is still pretty much the same. It, it, it defers the way you, you put it on the coding. Well, actually, it is. I, I, I think it should be the opposite, as, as I said. You, sh you, should, you shouldn't say that you want it protected. You should say that you want it unprotected. Because uh, when you want it, when you're especially, especially saying that you want it unprotected, uh, you know what you're doing. Or at least you should have an idea what you're doing. You should be, uh, the, the platform should lead you to the secure path first. Uh, another thing, if you ask me how could this be implemented in here, uh, one thing that could be done, if you th think about this example here, you should necessarily make the developer, uh, uh, should require this permission tag to be compulsory here. Uh, and add some other tag that could, uh, not necessarily another tag, you can, if you enforce this permission tag here, if you want an, an open uh, broadcast with serial, you can change the, the permission from signature to dangerous. So if another app wants to use it, it just declare this permission and uh, it will be fine. It's still, you have to specifically say that you're gonna use that resource, but it won't be restricted. Uh, you may say that this makes the platform more complicated, but the fact is that keeping it simple the way it is right now to have it exported is not causing anything good. Like what you get out of this simplicity is a bunch of security problems. Um, because if, even if you think about more, uh, I mean, simpler broadcast receivers such as I don't know, uh, on boot complete or, so, or something like this, uh, it may look that it's just an unprotected one, but it's actually not because the intent is only, can only be sent by the system. So uh, this situation, you are in the, under a protected state. Okay, now, moving on to the, to the second group, the improper SSL handling. Uh, what happens, at, the improper SSL handling happens when the developer have uh, a self-signed certificate and he wants to validate this in his app. This self-signed certificate can be either from the, uh, a website that is of his own or a web server or whatever, but it, does not, it was not signed by one of the certificates that are shipped with the uh, def uh, default Android key store. So, uh, what happens is the APIs to validate a self-signed certificate are very, very complicated and they have very poor documentation. If you look at uh, the documentation for this at uh, the Android developer's website, the hard part with is to create your own key store to validate is just a dot, dot, dot. So, they just put the easy part, that's once you get the everything ready, you just load it and validate. And the hard part's not there, so you have to guess. And uh, if you look for solutions, what people do is actually re-implement the, the, the trust manager. 
so that the check process server uh, method don't do anything. What this do actually is it will require the, the server to have a valid uh, certificate, but it won't validate the certificate. So uh, this will open your app for many in the middle attacks. So uh, if I'm in the middle of the app, I can provide my own self-signed attacker certificate, and it's going to be accepted because it's a valid certificate, but it's, and it's not validating the source. So, and this thing is it's very, very common. You can see by the frequency that we found these things during our analysis. And one of the reasons, again, is because if you search for self signed certificate validation on uh, the web, uh, you're going to be uh, directed to Stack Overflow website, and this is the first answer. Like, it has the most votes. The thing is that this problem has been uh, brought to media attention lately. So now at the same post, you can find the proper way to implement it, but it still has just a few votes, so I have to screw down. <laughs> but I hope this thing is, will get more popular over time and people will get this properly implemented. But the good thing is that Google is also aware of this thing because on Android 4.2, you have new APIs to validate self-signed uh, certificates. They are still a bit complicated, but it's already a step forward in this direction. So let's see what's happened. Maybe next year I'll be here with a new chart uh, on these things, and we'll see if it solved the problem or not. OK, uh, now the rest of the chart, if you remove the improper SSL handling and the open broadcast receivers, uh, open service, and open content providers. Uh, they are pretty much developers' fault. So there, is, there isn't much thing we can do in the platform, at least from my perspective, that would solve it. I just would like to point to them. They are very, very common. And please, if you have a, your own app, when you get back, check for these things. The first one is hard-coded crypto key. I don't know why developers think it's a good thing to put your crypto key inside your app, especially in Android, which is very, very easy to decompile and generate the code. You get pretty much plain test code off, out of an app. It's very easy to spot hard-coded key. And this is found on the most critical apps you can imagine. I won't point any names, but I'm pretty sure if one you can find them. And the other thing is to trust SMS messages to perform critical operations. Uh, I found many, many apps that, for instance, uh, triggers a factory reset or a data wipe on the phone from an SMS. But the point is that uh, SMS is not a secure channel. Uh, even if you trust restricted fields on an SMS, which wouldn't be able, uh, usually, uh, a, a person wouldn't be able to write it just by typing on the phone, it's, it still can be forced. So if you trust an, an authenticated SMS to trigger a secure critical operation, it can be triggered by anybody. And uh, this is also very common. So if you do use SMS to perform those critical operations, please use some sort of, of validation or encryption or whatever. But just, just don't trust it out of the box. OK, so now this is uh, another interesting thing, what I call the, the hidden issue, uh, it's, which is excessive permissions. I call it hidden because it does not appear in the chart. And it does not appear in the chart because it's extremely complicated to measure with the default tools. So it's, it doesn't, just because it was not on the chart, it doesn't mean that the apps didn't have this problem. It's just because we couldn't actually measure it. Uh, excessive permissions are not uh, a security issue on its own. But if you do have another uh, security issue on the app, they will potentialize the problem uh, a lot. Uh, one example that I have here is the pound to own uh, case. I don't know if you've heard of it. Pound to own is a uh, context. Uh, held at uh, Consequest. 
Originally, it was focused on uh, browser hacking. So it started with hacking from uh, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome OS, and then uh, uh, Chrome browser, sorry. And uh, then they moved, they, they created the mobile edition, uh, which uh, they tried to hack Blackberries, Androids, and uh, iPhones. And uh, last, year's, uh, uh, last year, this contest, the, the target for the Android was the Galaxy S3. So after the contest, I was directly involved in the analysis of the problem that was found. And uh, there was, it was a very complex attack. But one key point in the attack is that they managed to attack one preloaded app. And this preloaded, preloaded app had the install package permission. And, but actually, it, it was not using this permission. It, some developer added this permission there during development for whatever his reason and forgot to remove it. And uh, this is a system protected, uh, signature system permission. But this was preloaded, so it had the Samsung signature for that phone. And uh, due, it, due to this excessive permission, the attacker was able to actually install a payload in the phone. Uh, and then from, uh, from there, he could access pretty much everything. And uh, if it wasn't for the excessive permission problem, probably this attack wouldn't it couldn't be viable, or at least it would be way much harder to, to attack because they, they would have to find another vector for, for the attack. Uh, so let's look at why this thing happens. If you think about the, the developer point of view, what he, he does is that he uh, implements his app, adds some restriction, restricted APIs. What I call restricted APIs are APIs that requires you to declare some sort of permission in your app. And then he runs the app, the app crashes, and then he looks again at the internet for a solution. Again, he's going to hit Stack Overflow, find a lot of people telling them that they need to declare some permissions. They're going to copy and paste all the permissions they found. And then the program is going to, going to work. But I don't know anybody that after they reach this working state, they would just keep removing one by one the permissions to check if that was the one, the one that make it work. Like, if you reach the, the working state, the developer would just move on. And these permissions would be there for no reason. But why does the developer actually have to do this? Because if you think about the, uh, the, this restricted APIs, you know beforehand at compile time that some permission is required. And so why we can't automate this process in the SDK? I mean, th this won't cover every single case. Sometimes you have to manually declare a permission. But for, but, but for the most common uh, case, uh, you already know at compile time what you're going to need. If you're using some Wi-Fi API, you know that you require the Wi-Fi permission. If you're using some uh, phone state API, you know that you need uh, the phone state permission. But we don't have a clear mapping of this API permission thing. If you look at the, the documentation for the APIs, you can find which permission requires, uh, which permission that specifically API requires, but it all spread out uh, uh, spread the, uh, at the, the, the documentation. We don't have a clear map of this. And uh, this map is something that we need in, to be able to automate this process. Uh, and again, uh, as I said, it may not cover every single case, but just the fact that you can forget about the permissions initially, compile your app, and then get this uh, map created for you, and then just add your custom changes over it if needed, uh, it will write it will reduce this problem a lot. There, there is also, if you have this uh, mapping, you can create automated tools to, to be able to de detect this problem. There, there, was some, there was some attempts to do it, but the ones that you can find online are either outdated or incomplete. 
Well, to sum up, uh, the I hope I could show you that there are some changes we can do to the platform to change the workflow, the, the way we develop things, to make uh, to make Android more secure without having to change the developer itself. Of course, we want developers to be more secure aware to develop secure code. But still, if we can change the platform to make it more secure, why, wouldn't, why shouldn't we do it? Uh, also, about the design state, we should always aim for a development flow that leads the developer to the secure state before he reaches the insecure state. Uh, so that, as we showed, if we had something like this, these this vulnerability chart, you wouldn't even have these big chunks over there, over there, and uh, just by changing the, the flow, you could reduce this a lot. And, and that's pretty much it. I was a bit faster than I thought. I don't know if I spoke too fast, but if you have uh, if you know of any other places that this kind of design issue could be implemented or where you could find, uh, or if you have doubts or anything like that, I would, uh, I would be glad to hear from you or if you have any other questions. But thank you for, for being here today. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, actually, if if you see these posters outside about secure uh, Samsung Safe thing that ships with the Galaxy S2, uh, and uh, this pro no uh, the Note 2, sorry, uh, and uh, this project is going to use a bit of the security enhanced Linux, but uh, the project itself is more like a as I would say like a simple code, so how you could achieve this secure platform. It's not that easy to pour everything to a, to a product, to a final product, because uh, there's a lot of uh, custom code, things that partners ask us to implement that conflicts with it. But we, we are moving, we, we do take a lot of uh, security enhanced Linux. Well, actually, here, if you think about, for instance, the uh, the open uh, broadcast receivers, it wouldn't wouldn't do much because the fact that you have a, a broadcast receiver exported to everybody is a valid behavior. Okay, so you can actually have an app that exports functionality to everybody. It, it's not wrong. So uh, it, you can like have a policy in the in running in the, in the framework to say no, your app your app's not not right. I'm not gonna uh, execute what you're you're saying because you can just by looking at the app say no. The developer didn't want to export it to everybody, so I'm gonna block it. Well, you could like yeah, but uh, but I mean, how can you defer the legit exported broadcast receiver to the not intended exported broadcast receiver. You don't know what was the intention of the developer. They are both correct code. The point is that the, one of the developers didn't want to do it, but it, he didn't write problematic code. It's valid code. It so just don't do it. And that's fair enough. So how did you determine which was uh, Ah, okay. Well, th that's actually pretty, pretty easy because uh, for instance, if you have a broadcast receiver that will, uh, I don't know, place a call or send a file over the internet, and you can trigger it from every app. So every app has, for instance, the capability of uploading a file to the web without having to declare an internet permission. That's a vulnerability. Think about it. It's, it is a vulnerability when you export a functionality that would originally require you to declare uh, a permission. Anything else? 
All right. Thank you.